Let's continue onward with history of the churches, as you can see. No, okay, you can't see. Um, but uh, we're going to pick up where, right about where we left off last week, maybe just a slight um, review, but I'm not going to go through a whole bunch of slides to review uh, what we did last week. But what we've been doing is, is looking at the development of the apostate church. And uh, from the early days after the, after the time of the apostles, uh, there were seeds of apostasy planted during the, the time of the apostles. And then later on in those centuries following was when that really started to take root, those seeds and the fruit came. And, uh, and we see a lot of things that uh, apostate means um, being separated from God or falling away from God, distancing yourself from the truth. And so there were the true churches, the apostolic churches that were the true churches based on what Jesus Christ had started. And then as, as the seeds of apostasy started to grow, uh, then there was the development of a larger uh, organization that was not a biblical church. And um, so we're going to continue with that today. And I believe some of this we talked about last week, uh, that we covered last week. But we were in the middle of Christianized pagan practices, and that's where we're going to still continue today. Uh, and so we believe we talked about the Mass a bit. Uh, the Mass was adopted from pagan religions that offered sacrifices to their gods. Uh, the priestly Mass was instituted by Cyprian in the 3rd century. The Mass became a daily ritual in the 4th century. Transubstantiation was defined by Pope Innocent III in AD 1215. This is the Catholic doctrine that the way for the Mass is changed from bread to the actual body of Christ. And uh, so I gave you that. Uh, I gave you that uh, illustration last week about, you know, seeing the, uh, the on, on television, you know, the priest holding up the wafer saying, this is Jesus. Now, that's as absurd as it gets, but that is what they believe. That's what they practice, uh, that it actually is taken. And, and by the way, they, uh, they misrepresent what, when Jesus said, take, eat, uh, this is my body, uh, which is broken for you. He said, you know, they, they take that literally, that this is my body. This is my body. Now, Jesus was there, there in the flesh, but take ye, this is my body. So there was the, of all the things that are um, taken figuratively and allegorically <laughs> in the Bible, you know, they could have actually taken something like that, that he was speaking figuratively or as an example. Uh, why choosing that one to take literally when so many other things are not taken literally by them uh, is beyond me, but, uh, uh, but that is, that's the way it is. And so, we're, I, so we did cover this a bit last week, but take a look uh, back at verse, um, verse uh, 1 Corinthians and chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I just want to give you some scripture here regarding why uh, we believe this is, uh, why I believe, and I think all of you believe, I uh, uh, hope all of you believe, that it is not actually the body and blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23 says, For I have received of the Lord Jesus, of, of, for I have received of the Lord that which, I also, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And the same, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Of me, and so there, that key, the key word there in those two verses is uh, remembrance. Yeah. It is a remembrance. It is not a. It is not an actual turning. Uh, you know, uh, him being crucified fresh and anew. Him shedding his. Him. He's not still shedding his blood. Was that, uh, that was First Corinthians chapter eleven, um, and. Uh, you know, he's not, he's not still shedding his blood. His body is not still broken. And by that time, his body hadn't even been broken when Jesus said that. 
but he said, which is broken for you. And he was, so he was giving them that picture. This is what's going to happen to me. And it was going to happen very shortly. This do in remembrance of me. And he says, as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. So how, however many times you do that, just do it in remembrance. There wasn't a, a specified uh, time frame given that it had to be done every week or, you know, basically in a, in a ritualized fashion. But in verse 26, for as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Yeah. You show the Lord's death. It is a picture. It's a remembrance. It's a memorial of the Lord's death. It's not actually putting him to death fresh and new. And by the way, in Hebrews, I don't have the, the verse right in front of me. In Hebrews, the Bible says he died once for all. He's done shedding his blood. Uh, he's, he's already sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, and uh, that is all taken care of. Uh, his body was already broken. He's already physically, bodily ascended into heaven, and he's, he's no longer, there's no, there's no longer any flesh that, you know, bread that has to be broken that actually is his body. His body doesn't have to be broken anymore. No more blood needs to be shed. And so next, um, I think this is where we left last week. Uh, they Christianized pagan practices. The, the Christianization of pagan practices continues with uh, prayers to Mary. And I think I have something about that here. All right, well, we'll, we'll see. Uh, prayers to Mary. Maybe we'll get the prayers to Mary in just a second. Prayers to Mary, dead saints, and angels. Uh, the, the canonization of dead saints was first made by Pope John the, uh, the 15th in 995. And then there was also pilgrimages and holy relics. In the second and third, century, in the second and third centuries, pilgrimages be, began to be made to Palestine or the land of Israel. And bones and relics were brought back and were revered in the churches. At the Roman Catholic Siena Convent, in uh, Drogadane, Ireland, the head of priest Oliver Plunkett is preserved in a glass box and is venerated by the people. Now, you can look this up. You can do a search. I did a search. I decided not to put the picture up for you. I didn't want to gross anybody out. Uh, but you can look it up. You can look up the, the you know, priest Oliver Plunkett, his head. You can look that up online. It's very easy to find. And they have his head in a, uh, in a glass box. And they venerate that. They, they basically revere it. And, um, I mean, that's paganism. There's nothing, there's nothing Christian about that. There's nothing godly about venerating dead people or body parts or, or whatever it might be. Um, purgatory. Uh, let's go on to Purgatory was invented as a place where the unbaptized go for the purification of sin. The doctrine of purgatory was officially pronounced uh, by Gregory I in 593. So, um, so it's kind of a middle ground. It's kind of an in-between. Well, you just, if, if, you didn't, if you weren't baptized, if you weren't part of the church, yeah, you'll go to purgatory, you'll, you'll suffer for a while, but you're, that's just to purify you of sin and you know, after you die, we'll pray for your soul and, uh, and, uh, and hope you, you, know, you, you get out of there. Um, signs of the cross. Uh, so they have vain rituals, vain rituals, the sign of the cross, candles, extreme unction for the dead, kissing the Pope's feet, veneration of the cross, images and relics, holy water, worship of St. Joseph, uh, fasting on Fridays, and then the, the tradition of Lent. To me, Lent is one of the most, um, well, I don't know. It, it's, to me, Lent just doesn't make any sense. Ash Wednesday doesn't make any sense as far as, it's just a vain ritual. It's just a vain religion, a religious ritual. All right, we're going to we're gonna go. And then, well, well, not only that, not only, so we're going to give up something for Lent. Okay, so what are you going to give up uh, for Lent? Um, how about, you know, well, I'm going to give up, you know, I'm going to give up meat for Lent or I'm going to give up donuts for Lent. But, um, you know, these are just, um, these are just vain religious rituals have nothing to do with the Bible. There's nothing. And, and by the way, just because, 
Now, I believe that Lent is based on um, pagan traditions, pagan practices. Uh, there's, there's indication of that as far as, um, uh, as, far as uh, Tammuz and Samaramis and, and some of those uh, pagan deities and, and the 40 days goes into that. But 40 days is in the Bible. There's a lot of things that happen 40 in 40, you know, increments of 40 days. And one of them was uh, Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. So that is one of the things, that reason that's given as far as fasting uh, for, for Lent, but there's nothing in the Bible that gives the, uh, that, that indicates the apostles practiced that. They didn't practice 40-day fasting for Lent, you know, leading up to the resurrection of Christ and, and those types of things. Um, sale of indulgences, you know, it was, uh, it was a way for the Catholic Church to make money, and then, well, if you buy these indulgences, you know, you're, you're gaining favor with God. You have a better chance of making it. You just got to give us money. <laughs> And then worship of the Mass wafer. Now, extreme unction, I looked up extreme unction. As administered in the Western Church today, according to the rite of the Roman ritual, the sacrament consists in the unction with oil, especially blessed by the bishop of the organs of the five external senses, eyes, ears, nostrils, lips, hands, of the feet and for men of the loins or reins, and in the following form, repeat at each unction with the mention of the corresponding sense or faculty. Uh, so they would say, through this holy unction and his most tender mercy, may the Lord pardon thee whatever sins or faults thou hast committed by sight or by hearing, smell, taste, touch, walking, carnal, delectation. The unction of the loins is generally, if not universally, omitted in English-speaking countries, and it is, of course, everywhere forbidden in case of women. To perform this rite fully takes an appreciable time, but in cases of urgent necessity, when death is likely to occur before it can be completed, it is sufficient to employ a single unction on the forehead, for instance, with the general form. Through this holy unction, may the Lord pardon thee whatever sins or faults thou hast committed. Now, can, can someone tell me what anointing someone with oil has to do, anointing a body part has to do with being pardoned of whatever sins or faults you've committed? What does that have to do with having sins forgiven? That's once again putting the power back in the organization, putting the power back in the priesthood, that they somehow have that special touch where if they anoint you, then you can have your sins forgiven, rather than simply being able to go to God uh, directly through the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. By the decree of uh, 20, April 25th, 1906, the Holy Office has expressly approved this form for cases of urgent necessity. Now, speaking of a, of a ritual, um, <clears throat> uh, Russ was saying the other day about um, the crossing of the arms. Yes. If you're not going to take uh, communion. And he was at a, he was at a funeral, uh, and it was in a Catholic church. And, uh, and, if, if, and they wanted everybody, they say everybody come forward. Um, and he's, and uh, so everybody's going to come forward. But he said, if you don't want communion, just cross your arms across your chest. And that's, your, that's the signal uh, that, uh, that you don't want communion. And so Russ, um, you know, he, was, he, he, he made the right decision of, of how to handle that situation. He just <laughs> dismissed himself. And um, he didn't want to do either one, <laughs> which I agree with. And so I'm thinking, what, what, what's the purpose of the crossing of the arms? Is that, is that something that is actually widely practiced? And I looked it up, and it was kind of difficult to find too much about it that was actually official uh, Catholic teaching on it. But my best understanding of it is uh, that uh, it is an indication that it, it's for those people who are not able, according to the Catholic Church, to take communion, or maybe who are refusing communion, but for those who are disqualified by the Catholic Church from taking communion, they can cross their arms, and they're still indicating that they are still believing believers, uh, and that they want to receive a blessing. And so the the priest would go up and, and bless them. Is that what they were going to do there? He was he'd go up and bless them. So so they are still wanting, they, they aren't taking communion or they can't take communion or they're choosing not to for whatever reason, and so they, but they believe and they still want a blessing. 
So like, for example, with Rush, you know, if he had gone up and crossed his arms, you know, he's, he's still believing in the Catholic Church. I mean, uh, but he, he didn't do that. And, um, and so, but what I found out was apparently that is not an official church teaching. Apparently that's a tradition that has gotten started in various churches, but I don't believe that it's, a, it's something that there's a, an across-the-board agreement. It might vary based on the church you're in, whether or not they practice it that way. That, that's my understanding. There may be more to it, um, but that was all I could find at the time I, I looked it up. Um, so, so even that is not an official church uh, ritual, but, um, but apparently... I yeah. asked Terry, and she said that something that the Roman Catholic Church... The Roman Catholic Church does. I, I, okay. That's just what she said. All right. <laughs> Maybe as opposed to the... East, Eastern Church, the, the Orthodox <laughs> Church, Eastern Orthodoxy. I don't know. So, yeah, it's, it could be maybe in those who are the, the most um, ritualistic, strictest Roman Catholics, maybe that's what they do. I, I don't know. I could not find uh, something that was an in, a, a complete um, uh, uh, indication of, of, of that practice. But anyway, it goes into vain rituals, you know, vain rituals. It's, uh, it's just crossing your arms, doing the sign of the cross, and doing all this. They're vain rituals. They're, they're emptiness. Yes? I think it was this past week. I, I think I read it on Dean Crow's website. I'm not sure. Okay. But there's a verse that you can't stand before God and say, I, I, from Proverbs, a naughty person um, speaks, oh, winks with their eyes, um, speaks with their feet, and teaches with their fingers. Ah. So, I mean, just all throughout the Roman Catholic Church, all these little signs. And signs. Yeah, 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 interesting. I never thought of that. Yeah. yeah. A naughty person hmm. does those things. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting connection there. Um, unless they're deaf. Unless. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, if they're, if they're deaf, that's a different story. But, um, but you know, it is, it, it's, it's basically... They, they try to, as, as Jesus told the, the Pharisees, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. And so the, a lot of those people mean well, but the way they're trying to get to God is through things that are vain. They're empty. They're, 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 not, they're not biblical, not scriptural ways of, of getting to God or pleasing God. Uh, and by the way, let me just say, there are many, many well-meaning and decent uh, people who attend Catholic churches. So this is not an attack on Catholic people as a whole. This, when we are dealing with this series here, we are talking about the system, the deceptive system that people are in, those people who are in leadership who are leading people astray. We're not talking about the people who are just your average person in the neighborhood, in the town, who, go, who attends the Catholic church or is a very, even a very faithful Catholic. Um, you know, we're not talking about, you know, we're not attacking people in that sense of making personal attacks. We're talking about the system that they are a part of, and, and we have to address it because it is such a widespread influential system, not just in the Catholic Church, but you have the Orthodoxy, uh, you've got the Lutherans, you've got these other denominations, and they do their same, they do various rituals, maybe not in the same way, uh, but they are... Uh, but it's still very uh, ritual-based um, type of um, type of, of religion, and so it's it, there are many, many. As a matter of fact, you know, some of the um, we're more likely when it comes to certain moral issues, we are more likely to agree with a Catholic person, someone who's actually a very staunch, faithful, loyal Catholic. We're more likely to agree with them on certain issues such as of of, of, of marriage and sexuality. And abortion, we're more likely to agree with a Catholic person than we are if we were to go down to the Congregational Church, uh, you know, the UCC, the ones that are part of the UCC. Chances are we're going to have less in common with them than we would have with a Catholic person. Now, I'm still not for yoking up with people who, with we have to be careful about our close associations with unbelievers. So that's why I'm I'm not necessarily in as formal of a sense interested in yoking up with people who are unbelievers even for those good causes but if that's what we have in common that's what we have in common and it's a good thing um, and I think I don't know if it was Russ and I or if it was someone else who was going door to door with me if, I think it was a few years ago I think we we're over in Turner's Falls and we met I might have been Jordan uh, but we met someone um, who was a very very uh, 
you could tell they were a very faithful Catholic person, but they were very complimentary of a couple of things I think they asked about, or the person asked about what, uh, what we believe about a certain thing, or uh, I, I don't remember exactly what it had to do with, but they were very complimentary. They were very, uh, um, it might have even had to do with, um, I think it might have had to do with even working on Sundays or something. I, I don't know, this was an older person who was just, they, they were very, uh, very traditional, um, uh, conservative Catholic person. And, uh, and whatever it was, they were very complimentary about the answer that I gave them. And there are ways in which we do actually have more in common with some of them. So the, the attack is not on people, on, on, on individuals personally. We have to address the false teaching, the system, because no matter what, your stand, what their standards are, they still need Christ. They still need to turn from that. Uh, they still need to turn from that, uh, that, that system, that a system that does not provide salvation, and they need just simply to turn to Christ for salvation, uh, no matter what we have in common with them. And it's very hard for them to, to recognize that, that need and, and recognize the false teaching, uh, but that is the greatest need. And so that's, that's why we need to address these things. We need to understand it helps us to see, helping us, uh, seeing what's happened in the past helps us understand the present better and then also be able to go forward for the future uh, better. So there's the vain rituals. There's the uh, rosary. The rosary, this is where I get into the prayers to Mary. Um, the rosary, so when they pray the rosary, the most common prayer is the Hail Mary, which says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Nothing in the Bible indicates that prayer should be made to Mary. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's just completely opposite. Uh, nothing of the sort. That's just a man-made tradition, uh, making Mary the co-redeemer, co-redemptrix, uh, with Jesus, that somehow she had a part in our redemption when it was all because of Jesus Christ. She was simply the vessel. She was simply the instrument that God used. That's why she was uh, full of grace. You know, the, the angel said, Hail Mary, that are thou that art highly favored among women. Well, that's grace, uh, God's favor. Well, why was she favored? Well, she wasn't favored because we were going to have to, you know, it, well, she wasn't favored to the extent that she would be part of our redemption. She was just simply highly favored because she had the privilege of bringing forth the Savior, giving birth to the Savior. And, uh, but that has been turned into, you know, pray for us, Mary, now and at the hour of our death. I actually, a couple years ago at the fair, two or three years ago, had a discussion with, uh, with some people from that, it was from that Catholic church. And they had a, they had a big, I think they've, sh they've shrunk their, uh, 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 last year they shrunk their display, but it might have been two years ago. I uh, had a conversation with this person and, and, you know, nice people. And she actually mailed me a booklet a little later and, and about Catholic teaching and all that kind of stuff. And, and, um, but she even said, now she, she said, because I brought up about praying to Mary, that she said she'd be praying for me. And she says, and I will pray directly to, to God for you. And uh, so, you know, she was doing me a favor, I guess, because I... <laughs> She knew I wasn't for praying to Mary. So she says, well, no, I do pray to the Father. I do pray to God. So apparently they pray to God and Mary. And so she was going to respect me by praying to God for me instead of praying to Mary. So that was a nice thought. But, um, but anyway, we don't need to pray for, to, to Mary at all. Uh, it's just we can go directly to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the rosary is a set of beads used for ritualistic prayers. Mary has allegedly given many promises of protection, blessing, and salvation to those who pray the rosary. And you might have even seen, I've seen bumper stickers that says something like, America, pray the rosary, or America needs to pray the rosary. And like, that's the hope for America, let's pray the rosary. Um, Hindus and Buddhists still use rosaries. Uh, and then there is something called the scapular. Uh, in its original form, the sc All right, where'd that go? Okay. Uh, in its original form, the scapular is a part of the monastic habit, the outfit that monks wear. It is composed of two large pieces of cloth connected in the middle by narrower strips of cloth. 
much like an apron that covers both the front and the back of the wearer. The narrow strips provide an opening through which the monk places his head. The strips then sit on his shoulders, and large pieces of cloth hang down in front and in back. The scapular gets his name from the Latin word scapulae, which means shoulders. Today, the scapular is used most often to refer to a sacramental or religious object that has essentially the same form as the monastic scapular, but is composed of much smaller pieces of wool cloth, usually only an inch or two square, and thinner connecting strips. Technically, these are known as small scapulars, and they are worn by lay faithful as well as those in religious orders. Each small scapular represents a particular devotion and often has a certain indulgence or even a revealed privilege or special power to it. Uh, the most famous of the small scapulars is the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And that's the picture of one here. Um, that, is, that is what that is. Um, revealed by the Blessed Virgin Mary herself to St. Simon Stock on July 16, 1251. Those who wear it faithfully as an expression of devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, it is said we granted the grace of final perseverance that is, to remain firm in their faith even in the moment of their death. Now, all this stuff is just superstition. It is not, it's, it's, a, it's a faith in objects. It is, not, uh, it is not faith in the unseen. It is not faith in Lord Jesus Christ. It's having, putting our faith in, it is putting their faith in material objects, thinking that those objects themselves have some special kind of supernatural power to them. Uh, and then we have uh, bells. Bells are rung on many occasions to call people to Mass and other rituals, to signal prayers to Mary and drive away demons and storms. They used the bells in funerals, and priests would parade through the streets at night to remind people to pray for the souls of the dead. Now, bells in and of themselves, there's nothing sinful about bells themselves. But at the same time, how they're used often, they can be used in a very ritualistic way, and they can be used depending on what they are signaling uh, they can be used in a manipulative fashion, just as if, um, you know, bells are a reminder to pray for the souls of the dead, they can be used to uh, manipulate people in that way. Now, from Catholic.com, this article is called Smells and Bells. Um, and this is, this is uh, a defense of bells. And I'm, this is not the entire article, but it says, if the, the writer says, if spoken to gently, now listen to the, listen to the condescension condescending tone of this, of this person. Um, if spoken to gently, most fundamentalists can come to accept the fact that they too use sacramentals even if they reject the word. Uh, they are especially though, uh, they are especially uncomfortable though when told that many of these sacramentals originated in pagan religions. After all, a standard fundamentalist charge against Catholicism is that its distinctive customs and beliefs are of pagan origin. Fundamentalists don't want to admit that they too have borrowed from paganism, but that is exactly what they have done. After all, their churches are offshoots of offshoots from the Catholic Church, even if they won't admit the fact. No, that's why we're going through this uh, series, so you can see we're not offshoots of offshoots of the Catholic Church. Um, now, yes, the uh, Protestant churches, you know, most Protestant churches are, uh, if you trace their back from where, the, where they came from. Um, but fundamentalists believe their brand of Christianity goes straight back to uh, the New Testament times. It actually goes back only to the 19th century. That's not too long. Let's look at a few. Um, let's see here. Let's, let's look at a few Catholic practices that, uh, that most are fundamentalists. Um, he goes into the bells. Church towers uh, commonly have bells. Um, handbells, and and so anyway, it's a, it's a it's a I'm not going to read this whole thing, but uh, it's a it's a defense of the bells. But uh, so and and the fact is, I would read that and I'd say, well, the bells in and of themselves are not the issue. It's how bells are used, uh, just like candles are are uh, are used in in certain ways. Uh, it's not, there's nothing wrong with candles, but having mo many, many candles used in a religious setting uh, on a regular basis is, is usually goes back to more of the uh, uh, 
pagan After type of watching a wonderful life there's many people that actually believe that every time a bell rings an angel gets a there you go yeah it's it's a, there and yeah that, i forgot about that i forgot about that it's a wonderful life and when a bell rings an angel gets its wing um so so anyway that's where we're going to stop uh because we're going to shift gears now and go a different direction next week but th- that was the christianization of pagan practices and by the way just because there is Something that a church, even a biblical church, happens to do that is something that someone else does who is not a Christian does not mean they borrowed it from them. But when you look at history, you can see in this case there was the Christianization of the pagan practices. There was an adoption of it, and, uh, and, and there is that connection there. Uh, so let's, uh, we'll stop right there.